Uh, my name is Kate Cahey. I'm the PI of the Chameleon Project. Um, and I will introduce the webinar today, and then we'll hear from Jason Anderson, who's the Chameleon DevOps lead, and who is the main force behind the development of, of GNN, so it will be straight from the horse's mouth. Um, so we'll start with a quick introduction to what Chameleon is for those of you who are new to the system. Chameleon is a testbed for computer science research. And what that means is that it has been engineered to adapt itself to your research needs. That means that in our main offering, which is um, a distributor over three data centers, one at University of Chicago, one at Texas Advanced Computing Center, and one the home of Frontera, and one uh, at Northwestern, so across three different data centers, we provide resources that are reconfigurable at bare metal level. Right? So our users uh, experiment with, uh, with the design of different operating systems, different virtualization solutions, um, a lot of machine learning. Those things require bare metal configuration. They sometimes require you to start from custom kernel, have access to serial console. Now, across those three data centers, we also have resources that represent an investment in scale so that people can lar run large scale experiments. So we've got homogeneous partitions of many thousands of cores. We've got six petabytes of storage and we've got connection um, that operates at 10 gigabits per second. Right? So that allows you to do networking experiments with large flows. But we also have investment in diversity. We have um, a lot of different GPU clusters. Uh, we have FPGAs, ARMS, ATOMS, interesting networking hardware, and so forth, right? So those two things together, bare metal reconfiguration and a lot of beefy data center resources allow our users to run a range of computer science experiments. Uh, one notable thing about Chameleon is that it's built on top of a mainstream uh, open source infrastructure called OpenStack, right? And that has many benefits because it means that it will be right off the gate, uh, very familiar to many of you. It's also familiar to the operators. Most importantly, it allows us to work with a large development community that numbers in thousands and leverage the features that they produce, but also allows us to contribute to that community with all the innovative things that we develop. And it also, of course, helps us with compatibility with other clouds, in particular cl uh, commercial clouds, because there's much tooling that converts images between OpenStack and commercial clouds, for example. So that comes in very useful. And finally, we live to serve. Right? So over the uh, lifespan of the project, we've had the privilege of serving almost 6,000 users. Uh, the project has been in existence for almost seven years now, um, and we've got more than three more years to grow. Um, our, our users worked on over 700 different education, um, uh, computer science research, or innovative application projects, um, and, and they came from 45 different countries. So it's a very large, very diverse research community working on a lot of interesting projects. Recently, however, we started noticing that uh, the research is moving out from data centers, it's moving out from the cloud and into edge computing. Right? Edge devices are much more popular. So how do we enable research like that? So just to give you an example of a few projects that, that people um, work with. So one thing that they work on is, is video analytics, for example. So they have an edge device um, and, and an IoT device that's connected to it. The IoT device, like a drone or maybe some mounted camera somewhere, gathers uh, videos and, and they analyze those videos for um, all sorts of interesting things like social distancing. And some of that analysis takes place on the edge. And then some of that takes place in the cloud, right? So it's an interesting research question now whether it makes more sense to send those images to the cloud and al analyze them there, or whether you analyze them on the edge and then send the results to the cloud. Or maybe you do model splitting, right? You do a little bit of analysis on the edge and, and then some in the cloud. A similar type of things are happening with environmental sensing. So here we're not necessarily talking about images, we're talking about other different qualities that people can sense. And then finally, there are projects like federated learning. So you've got multiple edge devices that are um, connected to various IoT devices that gather data which is private. And that data cannot be shared. 
right? So several months ago, for example, we had an article on our blog from a user who was gathering, was working with biometrics data, trying to recognize, for example, fingerprint spoofs from real fingerprints, right? So that it's very difficult to share this data. So the, the learning has to take place on the edge. But then there is an aggregator that takes, takes those learning modules from the edge, from multiple devices on the edge, and, and combines them together in the cloud, right? So it's federated learning. It's learning from many federated edge devices. And in fact, last month, we had an article from one of our users working on federated learning, right? But they can only emulate their experimental environment in Chameleon up to now, right? What we would like for them to do is to actually carry out their experiments on the edge, right? So it is the case that up to now, we were providing those um, AI capabilities in Chameleon in the cloud, but we were not providing those capabilities on the edge. So what does an edge testbed look like, right? If we have a, a bunch of edge devices, how do we make them available to users? And we came up with sort of four initial points of defining that testbed. Right. So first of all, we said, well, we're going to have a, a, a Chia Edge virtual site. So if you come to, to the uh, uh, main chameleon um, uh, test bed, what you're going to see is that you can go and reserve resources at TAC, at University of Chicago, at Port Northwestern. Each site has a gateway to the site, right? Um, and, and, and from that, through that gateway, you can point to resources and reserve them. Chia Edge does not have such gateway because those devices could be anywhere, right? So we created a virtual site, we replicated this gateway for you, and that virtual site is capable to reach any device anywhere. And through that virtual site, users can make requests to reconfigure edge devices and then connect those edge devices to um, AI capabilities in the cloud. What we also thought that our users, and by the way, how do we reconfigure those devices, right? So, so this is something I was forgetting to explain. In regular Chameleon, we reconfigure those devices via bare metal reconfiguration, right? I just explained that. This is necessary for developing new operating systems and so forth. Edge devices don't really allow you to do that, right? They, they very often don't implement the IPMI interface, which you need to reconfigure things on bare metal level. So we decided that we will reconfigure them by deploying containers, Docker containers on those devices. And this seemed like a good idea because a lot of people who do research on actual edge devices already use Docker containers to reconfigure them. So we'll deploy Docker containers, then those Docker containers will be connected to the various sensors, uh, cameras and, and other such things uh, that the device is connected to and, and through that, you will be able to reprogram your device working with the edge container, but yet will have access to all those different sensors. So then we said, okay, we can provide some edge devices, but the interesting thing about edge devices is the setting they're in, not necessarily always the device itself, right? So providing different devices in the same setting allows you to do some experiments, but a relatively narrow range. So what we decided to do is allow users to bring their own devices and give them an SDK that allows them to join those edge devices to Chameleon such that users, other users, their students or their collaborators can now allocate this device and collaborate with them on programming that device and, and creating experiments that span both this device and again, cloud resources on Chameleon, right? Our GPU resources or, or other resources with Skype. And then finally, we also said, well, maybe some users will want to connect a device to the test bed, but not share it, just keep it to themselves, sorry, just, just one device, and they configure it however they like it. So for those users, we want to provide a capability that adds the device on the same network as the test bed. And then you can't allocate the device via the test bed, but you can allocate all the other test bed resources via the test bed. So in this webinar, we will cover the first two bullets of that functionality. Those are the things that we have ready for you right now. So we have a, a bank of edge devices that are ready for you to be reconfigured. The third bullet, mixed ownership, 
right now we handle that on a case by case basis. We, we work with uh, people who want to add a device to the testbed, share it with their students and collaborators. And if you fall into that category, please contact us as soon as possible, right? Send me mail or send Jason mail. Our, our email addresses were on the, on the first page of, of, the, um, of the slide deck here. And then later this summer, we will provide bullet four, right? The capability to add your own device to the testbed. A few words, oh, and by the way, um, we are trying to do this. We're trying to give you those capabilities as quickly as we can so we can work with you on a range of different projects and, and that we can hear about your requirements and prioritize them as soon as we can, right? So welcome to the Summer on the Edge. Uh, please tell us if you can run your experiments. Tell us also if you can't run your experiments. We will do whatever we can to enable your experiment and learn from that and see what capabilities we still need to provide. So a few words now about uh, some of the implementation. How is this all implemented? Well, um, as usual, we want to build on top of mainstream open source for the reasons that I just explained. Um, so OpenStack already had an implementation that um, reconfigured resources by um, deploying containers. We took that implementation, opened it up, um, and carefully looked at the assumptions that it makes, right? The assumptions that it makes is that the resources that OpenStack, OpenStack operates on are in a data center. Our resources are not in a data center, right? So we had to invalidate those assumptions, but we couldn't invalidate all of them. That's a lot of work. So we had to carefully select which ones we want to program around and which ones we feel comfortable living with for a while. Um, and then finally, we combined this with Chameleon tools, right? Those tools were developed to work with OpenStack. So those tools that provide, for example, federated identity and Jupyter integration were now um, joined to our OpenStack reprogramming for the edge. Um, Chia Edge is right now in preview, which means you know it's reliable, uh, it's secure, it's OpenStack. Um, you know it's it's mainstream infrastructure that has been adapted to the edge, uh, but it's perhaps not feature complete, right? So you you just heard about some features that we provide and some features that we don't. It doesn't necessarily scale. Right? So there's still a lot of development that will have to happen, but you can start working on it right now. You can kick the tires and, and tell us what you think. New features will be coming out throughout the summer. And there is one more difference um, uh, from the mainstream Chameleon offering, which is that support is not through the help desk, but via the mailing list. This is because it's a, it's a preview thing. We're hoping to um, uh, understand better what you're working on, what the shortcomings of the infrastructure are. And we're also hoping that we will discuss with other users and share with other users how this works for you and how this does it. A few pretty pictures, uh, what building a Chia Edge entailed is we went from machines in the data centers to machines that were constructed on people's kitchen tables with the help of cats and dinosaurs. Um, and a quick run through of what the uh, Chia Edge experimental workflow looks like. Right? So if you want to find out what devices we offer right now, you can go to the Chia Edge website, which if you go to the Chameleon main website and you click on the experiment tab, you choose Chia Edge from the experiment tab, it will take you to a page which has a resource table or, or directs you to a page that has resource table and an availability calendar. So you can check whether that device has been um, reserved or not. You will be able to allocate resources, and that means both devices and public IPs that you can assign to those devices, right? So any device that you have, you will be able to assign public IP to. And you can make advanced reservations for any device, right? We have expressive interface, which means that you can say, I want a Raspberry Pi, or you can say, I want an NVIDIA Nano, which we hope NVIDIA Nanos will be available by the end of this week. Or you can say, I want this specific device, right? Because you, you know that this specific device, you found out in our resource table, this specific device is connected, for example, to a camera that is of interest to you or, or to an SDR, a software-defined radio that is of interest to you. Now, once you allocate those devices, make an advanced reservation, your reservation shows in the availability calendar, 
you can now deploy a container, a Docker container on those devices. And you can take Docker images from Docker Hub. You can configure them. Once you are done configuring them, you can snapshot them. And, and then finally, you can use Jupyter in order to orchestrate those devices, potentially using also uh, resources in the cloud. Now, as for anything in Chameleon, you can access these capabilities in three ways. You can use either the web GUI, the command line interface, or you can use the Python library that is integrated with the Jupyter notebook. And when JSON um, shows you the, uh, the demo of how to use things, uh, he will be showing you also how to use Jupyter in Chameleon. And a quick rundown of Chiedev side by side, for those of you who are familiar with the Chameleon offering, so with the Chameleon Cloud, right? So in the Chameleon for bare metal, we uh, reconfigure bare metal machines. In the Chameleon for Edge, in Chi at Edge, we reconfigure Edge devices by deploying containers, right? Both implement single tenant isolation, right? So in both cases, you get the node or the device all to yourself. Um, and then uh, both implement public IP assignment uh, both give you uh, all those different um, um, interfaces there was just talking about. But then while Chameleon is owned and operated by Chameleon, so all the hardware we have is owned by Chameleon, operated by uh, on Chameleon sites, Chi at Edge provides a mixed ownership model, right? So we give you some devices, but you can also add your own devices to the test bed in such a way that it's shareable. Okay, so with that, I'm going to uh, give it over to Jason, who will show you how to actually use all those capabilities. Thank you, Kate, for the intro. I just need to share my screen now. Great. Okay, um, yeah, so I'm going to show not only the, what sort of Kate just set the stage with regarding um, the new Chiat Edge capabilities of Chameleon. But first start off giving just a little quick rundown of, sort of how to um, access Chameleon for maybe those of you who haven't been familiar with Chameleon um, in the past, because one of the, um, the things that we try to do with the Edge platform is make it really work very similarly to our existing offering. Um, so if you've, if you've learned one, you can learn the other. And if you haven't learned either, um, you also try to make them easy. So to get started, uh, you can go to www.chameleoncloud.org and you can log in. If you don't have an account, you can sign up. And as Kate mentioned, uh, we support login with federated identity. Most uh, host institutions, um, you can log in with their credentials, but we also allow login with a Google account if, um, if all else fails. So um, I'm already logged into my university uh, authentication portal, so it should uh, zip me through. Zip me through, he said. There we go. Um, so now we're, uh, when you get in here, you'll first arrive at the sort of project dashboard, and this is where you'll get a little overview of any allocations that you have on the test bed. In order to use a test bed like Chameleon, you do have to apply or be added to a project with an approved allocation. Um, in order to get an allocation, if you um, do not have one already, you can apply for one. However, uh, you have to have, um, you have to be a, a PI or a, um, a, basically the leader of a project or a teacher in order to do this. To request PI status, you can do so on your user profile page. Um, when you create a project, you don't have one already, you just sort of provide a little bit of information about what you're doing and uh, what you want to use Chameleon resources for. And in particular, if you are doing this for uh, the Chia Edge platform, please mention that in, the, um, in either the abstract or the resource justification so that we, uh, we know that you're uh, an Edge user because we're really interested in, in these projects in particular. Uh, the projects are typically approved in about uh, a day. And then uh, sometimes you know, we ask you for more information if, if there's not enough information about what you intend to do. Uh, once you have um, one of the projects, uh, oops, once you have the, the project approved and you, you can actually start adding more collaborators to them. And you can also get a view of like, what is your current usage of the allocation? 
and which then also informs you if it's maybe time to request an extension to it. So just a general overview of like user management, how to get going and uh, how to get started. Now, we're mostly gonna be talking about um, the Chi at Edge platform today. Although a lot of the things I'm gonna show will extend if you decide to use Chameleon uh, for, for bare metal as well. So yeah, like as Kate said on the experiment tab, if you go down, you can get to the uh, Chi at Edge preview. And then here we have a little bit of a summary of information relevant to uh, the edge, somewhere at the edge. First is, yes, mention that we have this mailing list, Chameleon Edge users, uh, which you can find on a, it's a Google group. We encourage you to, to join and share your experience uh, working on the edge platform and share your questions, uh, maybe problems that you find, uh, particular things that you're interested in, it's all good. We also have a, a little link to goes into a little bit of more information about what we currently have on the test bed. Um, so right now we just have uh, essentially a bunch of Raspberry Pis that we've set up, but um, we've got in particular Jets and Nanos coming online in the next days, and we're looking to expand into more types of devices uh, over the, the summer and the, the coming year. So we also have a really nice documentation page that gives you a um, an overview of getting started, basically what I've just sort of shown you, plus what I'm going to show you in the uh, in the demo as we go on. And lastly, uh, the last part of the demo, we're going to be using a, um, a Jupyter Notebook, which also is an example of how to use Chameleon, uh, Chameleon's edge capabilities via a Jupyter interface, and um, we'll sort of show some of the benefits of that. Okay, so just to get started here, um, I'm going to access the, the user interface for the Chi Edge platform now. Um, so when you sign into any Chameleon site, you're gonna get an interface that looks kind of like this. Uh, we have single sign-on for all of them. So if you're logged in once, you don't have to keep logging in again over and over. And um, what you see on the left here is, is basically a, a rundown of all the different things that you can create and reconfigure on the cloud. And again, if you're coming from a bare metal site on Chameleon, this is gonna look very similar um, or familiar. And also if you've worked with a commercial cloud like AWS or Google um, or Azure or something, a lot of these concepts really translate pretty pretty well. Um, we have something similar to CloudFormation. We've got something similar to um, you know, Elastic uh, Load Balancers and Elastic IPs. And um, it is, Chameleon is basically a, you know, a full-fledged cloud experimentation platform, but with the additional uh, sort of focus on enabling research in computer science. And yeah, the Edge platform is no exception. Um, so right now, just for the purposes of this demo, I'm going to show you uh, just how to create a first container. Um, so what you can do is open this uh, create container thing. I'm going to actually also show you an important first step later, which is making a, a lease for a, a device, which is a basically a, a, you get exclusive access to one of those edge devices. Right now, I'm just going to launch kind of an ad hoc container, uh, which is a currently an enabled capability that we have. And this just schedules a container on some on some free node um, in the, the system. And uh, then what I'm going to do is type in the name of an image. In this case, you can really type in any uh, Docker, Docker Hub image and it will pull it down. You can see here that it's pulling it from Docker Hub. And if you are, if you've used Docker in the past, a lot of this, these options are gonna look very familiar. They basically translate to common Docker flags and um, parameters. Uh, so you can override the command. In this case, I think the default for this is just to open and start a shell. And you can also customize things such as the uh, CPU and um, CPU memory, uh, all these different things. One thing that is important though, uh, you can connect it to a network. Uh, this is how you connect containers to each other. So even if you're launching maybe multiple containers on a few different edge devices that are geographically spaced out throughout the, the country or the, the world, 
uh, one thing that we provide is a sort of an, uh, an overlay network that just basically means that you can launch containers onto this network and they'll see each other um, over a private IP address. So even if they don't have a public IP address assigned to them, like at your host institution or at your, you know, if you're setting a device up at your house or something, um, you can still connect them in this way, which is a pretty powerful uh, utility. Uh, what else do I want to go over? Security groups. So um, by default, all incoming ports to your container are blocked uh, for security. And uh, but you can use security groups to selectively open ports or even add more restrictive rules. Like if you only want to allow um, certain types of traffic outbound, you can you can customize that here. Okay. Um, going to try this out and we'll see if it, if it picks. We've got some nodes that were sort of in, in development now and I'm gonna see if it lands on one of those. But uh, so when you start the, the container request, it will attempt to schedule the, the container on one of the devices that we have. Let's kind of click through here. Okay, so it was able to create the container and now we see that it's moved into the starting phase. When you click on the container, you can see um, a few different pieces of information here. Notably, uh, you can see that it got uh, an address assigned on this network that we launched it on. If there were any logs yet, which I think this one is it, is it running yet? Yeah, it is running, very good. If, if there is any, um, anything printed to standard out by the container process, like what you would get when you sort of just run a, a container, uh, it would be showing up here in the logs. Right now, this is just a shell, so it doesn't really have anything interesting. Um, the other, uh, is you can do a few things with the container at this point. You can sort of change, uh, change its name, change some of its um, resource allocations, like if you can be limited how many CPUs it was able to, to use. You can also manage the life cycle of the container in a few, few basic ways. And uh, one, one cool thing uh, you can also do is uh, just run little one-off commands. Um, this is, oops, uh, this is sort of useful if you're kind of testing uh, something kind of small about the container's environment. Uh, oops, I think I put a space in there, or something. Oh, T2, T2. And yes, it will give you a nice uh, error output if you uh, type in the command incorrectly. Uh, and so, yeah, so this one, it has uh, printed out some results of, of that ping. And yeah, I think in general, you can do um, a lot of stuff with the graphical user interface in terms of just uh, simply launching containers that you've, that you've configured and published to Docker Hub and then connected them in various ways. Uh, however, there's really a, a few aspects of really um, running the, the container system currently that you, you can only do from the command line interface or the Python interface. And so I'm going to show you the latter of those, which is the Python interface. And um, one uh, benefit of using that is also that you can leverage it in a Jupyter notebook. Uh, so while you can use the GUI to, to manage your containers, if you want to do some more fancy stuff, um, you're probably going to be interested in the uh, Jupyter and Python interface. So I'm going to go back to this Chia website just to show you how I'm going to get here. But we have this quick start notebook. And this is um, a, uh, if you, it's available on something that we call Trovi, which is a, an, basically a collection of Jupyter notebooks um, packaged as, as experiments and as examples that we have prepared for you on Chameleon. But importantly, um, anybody, you can also, you can create your own uh, Jupyter Notebook artifact and save it to your own little private library, um, which you know people do when they're working on a project and they're kind of um, iterating on stuff. So um, we're going to launch this now. And now what this does, is it'll actually open up a, oops, it'll open up a new uh, Jupyter notebook server for you. And my session timed out, so I need to uh, try this again. And the first time that you land here, it's going to um, sort of spin up a, uh, a server for you on demand. And this little server is, is yours. You can install new um, software into it. 
it will get cleaned up after a while if it's inactive for a while, but while you have it, you're free to install additional things. The one thing that does persist is we have a, a directory that's kind of your working directory here, and that that um, stays. So if you, even if your server is torn down, you come back you know, a few weeks later or whatever, you'll still have your files files saved there. Okay, so if you've used Jupyter before, then um, you might be a bit familiar with this interface. Uh, if not, uh, Jupyter is great. <laughs> we, we use it a lot for, for giving demonstrations and webinars like this because it's a really good way of showing uh, not just the, the code, but sort of the context around it. And what's cool about the Chameleon's Jupyter environment is that it's sort of deeply integrated with Chameleon. What that means is these notebooks can perform actions on your behalf uh, to the testbed to, for example, reserve and configure resources. And uh, this sort of makes it a really nice way to be configuring the testbed, especially when you're doing something that's a little bit perhaps more complicated. So that's what we're going to do today. So the first thing you need to do is sort of say which set of resources you're going to be using. In this case, we're going to be using the, uh, the, the Chiat Edge resources. If you're using bare metal, you would select a different site here. We've got you know, sites at UC, NTAC, and Northwestern at this point. You also need to tell it which allocation you're going to be using because everything is uh, ultimately tied to that. OK. So uh, what we have also in the container environment is this library called Qi. And as you can probably guess, this is the uh, related to Chameleon in some way. This is a uh, effectively a Python library that uh, wraps up some pretty um, common use cases on the Chameleon testbed and makes it a bit easier to, uh, to deal with the, the testbed APIs. Chameleon is built on top of OpenStack. OpenStack is a very rich Python client library already, but sometimes uh, because of how um, you know generic they try to make the clients, they're a little bit hard to work with. Like they are trying to do everything because they sort of have to do everything. So we try to sort of make it a bit easier for Chameleon users to use the parts that are make sense to them. So the first thing that this notebook uh, goes through is one aspect I haven't shown, which is actually making a lease for resources. So again, if you've used Chameleon uh, bare metal, this concept of making a reservation is, is not strange to you, perhaps. Uh, but if you're maybe coming from a site cloud like AWS or something, um, this is a bit different. So when you are when you want to use a resource on Chameleon, uh, you, you make a reservation for it. We, you can reserve it for um, up to seven days. You can extend that reservation if uh, nobody else has sort of indicated that they uh, want that resource in the future. Um, what that enables is A, you have the sort of the guarantee that those resources are going to be available when you need them. And B, you uh, know that you are the only one who has those resources. So this is particularly important if you're working on something that has, um, you, you want performance isolation, you want to control as much of the environment as possible and um, know that your results are gonna be sort of you know, predictable and, and uh, reproducible. Um, so we've taken that and extended it to edge devices. So um, any edge device that's available on the Chiat Edge platform, you can reserve. And uh, in this case, I'm going to uh, use some helpers from the Chameleon library. Uh, one helper just to, you know, um, I just wanna get a lease that starts now and ends in two days. So we have a little helper for that. And now I'm going to sort of assemble my list of things that I want to reserve. And in this case, I only really care about reserving uh, uh, an, an edge device. I'm going to reserve one of them. Uh, it's going to be a Raspberry Pi model four. Uh, in the future, we'll have different sort of ways you can specify these, these resources as we build out the inventory. And then I'm just going to do that. And it's going to make the request. If there are resources available, it will then uh, reserve them uh, for that time period and because this uh, this lease actually starts now so it's even though it's an advanced reservation it's it's effectively on demand uh, and this is a uh, very often the case unless we're in a period of high utilization or there's a conference deadline even though it is you're reserving it on demand you can effectively get resources um, uh, on demand okay so i just did that and now importantly i saved this lease id because i'm gonna need it later um, and now we're going to use a different sort of set of utilities in the container library. 
And I'm going to basically do what I just did um, in the graphical user interface demo. I'm going to launch a container. I'm going to launch a different one this time. I'm going to launch a Python container because I'm going to use this built-in Python HTTP server module, which is a really handy way just to spin up a web server serving some directory. And I'm going to make it serve this directory. And uh, now I'm going to be exposing a port. One of the cool parts about using this is that it will actually open the port for you by configuring a security group. So you don't need to go through that. And uh, the last important part here is I'm tying it, sort of saying which reservation to launch this, this container under. So this just makes sure that it puts it on one of the devices that I reserved. Um, I'm also telling it, you know, I think by default, Python will just start similarly to the CentOS uh, container image, it'll just launch a shell. I'm asking it to um, instead launch a, uh, a Python HTTP server exposing it on that port. And now while that's sort of requesting, just to sort of prove to you that this is doing, uh, let's say it is. So if you go to the Edge platform, you can see that it did actually, it's created the container under my project uh, here. So you can actually sort of verify that this is doing what you want by going back to the, the GUI. Okay, so we're now, uh, we have a little helper here that also sits and waits until the container has started. This can be helpful, especially because when you're in a Docker, uh, sorry, a Jupyter notebook, you can sort of just execute one, two, three, four and go down all the steps. And this just makes sure that this step effectively blocks until it's ready. Cool. So our container is done. We can do similar stuff that I was just doing in the GUI. Notably, uh, I can run little one-off commands, like just listing the contents of this directory. Um, but now let's get into some stuff that we haven't done before. So the first thing, is I can actually assign a public IP address from the pool of addresses that we have allocated on the Edge platform. And what this will do is it'll make it so I can actually access uh, my container over the internet. So I can expose some port, I can access it. Uh, you can also use this to connect your, um, your, edge, your Edge experiment environment to some other environment, as long as it can be reachable on, on the internet. Um, so that's very useful. Now, another thing that is kind of cool to do, and you have to be using the, uh, the Python or CLI interface to do this, is you can actually directly upload to the container. And so for this case, I'm going to upload some files that I'm going to, I'm going to upload them to the web server. And this is a cool thing as well, because I can actually upload local files from, from the Jupyter interface to the container. So in this case, I've got this little um, HTML file that just says, you know, hello from Chia Edge. And now I'm going to upload to my container. You can see I'm just at a relative path to this folder. I'm going to upload it to this folder on the container. And that is the folder that I'm serving out of currently. So I would expect that when I do this, um, I should be able to access that page. And indeed, I can. And now, um, you can also, you know, just to prove that uh, this is sort of happening, we can do that. So now I've changed the, the contents. I can re-upload it, can refresh, and I get that updated contents. So this is nice because I really haven't had to do anything. Um, I haven't had to leave this environment. I can sort of edit some files, push them up. It's kind of a nice IDE for um, experimentation. Um, we do have support snapshotting. So if, for example, I just uploaded some files to this container, changing its original contents, I can now snapshot that container. And what that does is it, it saves it not to a central Docker Hub registry or something, but it saves it as a, a private container image to uh, an internal image storage system um, on the, the Edge platform. And you can then relaunch that private image uh, later uh, when you're when you're launching it, you basically specify that you're launching from Glance as opposed to from Docker Hub, and you specify the ID of the image. So we do support snapshotting if um, that's useful to you. That's all I wanted to do with that container, so I'm going to now request that be torn down, and we're going to do something a little bit more complicated as the the, the final experiment here. In this experiment, I'm going to launch two different containers. 
And we're going to do a kind of real-time communications, just a little baby experiment where the idea is one container is going to be hosting a um, basically a service that captures messages from other connected devices. But then I can also connect to that central service and pull messages off of it. Um, this is a message broker um, idea, and uh, this is a sort of a commonly used thing in uh, at least in, in IoT deployments is you would have something uh, doing this role, handling the, the passing of messages between devices. Uh, MQTT is a, a popular implementation of this. It's a protocol and a client and server mechanism. And so we're gonna be showing that. So I've got one container that is sort of listening for those messages. And then one, one container whose job is just to push random data in there. And then we're going to connect the notebook to that uh, message server and just be showing messages as they're being published. So the idea is that as data is flowing from this device uh, container to this device container, uh, we're gonna be showing it uh, in the Jupyter notebook in real time. Okay, so I'm gonna get this going here and then talk a little bit about what, what's new in this, this uh, invocation. A lot of the stuff is the same. Um, I am launching a different image because I, I want to launch this Mosquito MQTT server. I'm exposing um, a few ports that it requires. Uh, I'm still reserving it. I'm still passing a reservation so that it launches it on one of the devices that I want. But the last thing is I'm able to pass in mounts. And if you've used Docker contain, um, containers, you've probably used mounts before. It's a very, very common way of configuring a container at runtime. The idea being that uh, you don't want to rebuild a container anytime that you are changing a, a configuration config, configuration file, for example. Instead, you configure the container to expect to find a configuration file at a certain well-known location, and then you provide that file in conjunction with the container image in a kind of together they have different runtime behavior. Uh, so mounts are really important. And the, our Edge platform supports this. And the cool part is that similar to what I just showed with launching the, uh, the web server, uh, I can actually take a configuration file that I've stored here in my Jupyter server. It's a configuration for, for Mosquito. I'm gonna actually take that and send that up with the container launch request. Okay. So I've configured that server and uh, while I was talking, it finished launching and we can see that it has a private IP. And this demo is also an example of containers communicating over these private IPs. So I'm not gonna be assigning any sort of um, uh, public IP address to uh, the publisher, for example. And, but it's still gonna be able to, to reach the, uh, the central message system. Okay, so again, I what I just did was I started this this one. So now I'm going to start this one, the publisher. This one um, is again pretty similar. I'm actually using the same Docker image, but uh, in this case, I'm going to reconfigure it to not do its normal behavior, which is to start a server, but instead I'm going to tell it to run a custom script, and that script is again, something I'm going to provide the container when it launches. Uh, this is just kind of a simple toy thing that it, it actually is using awk to just print some random number between two values. And then it uses a, um, a, a, a client of, for the MQTT server that's able to push messages under a certain topic, which is just like a, kind of like an inbox uh, of messages. Importantly, I tell it how to contact the server via this environment variable that's called mosquito host. Now that environment variable uh, resolves to the private IP of the server that I created before. So this is one way that it's actually really nice to use the uh, programming interface like Python because you can just, you, know, you can assign things to variables, you can then reference them later, and you can um, sort of orchestrate more complicated experiments in a, just like if you're writing, writing code. So I think, yeah, we've gone over mounts, uh, we've sort of gone over command. Uh, so I'm overriding the command here and good, that's, that's it. And while I've been talking, 
publisher has been created. And again, if we go back here, I would expect to see two containers running, my publisher and my server. Okay, as a final step now, we're going to connect to that uh, public server and then start pulling off some messages. However, the Jupyter uh, server application here, it, it doesn't have access to the private networking of those two containers. Those containers can exchange traffic but with, with each other, but um, I need to actually be able to access one of them. So again, I, I pull out the public IP address and assign it to the, um, to the server. Now I'm going to connect to that server using a Python client implementation of MQTT. This is a pretty um, sort of standard library for this. And because it's such a common thing, we've actually bundled it into the, the Jupyter server environment that you get by default. So I'm creating an instance of the client and when it connects, I'm saying to immediately start listening to events on this, um, you know, this inbox, this, this topic. Anytime a new message comes in, I wanna know about it. And then I'm gonna to connect to it and then start uh, sort of priming the pump, so to speak, like listening for um, some, some messages. Okay. And now the last bit, I'm going to now sort of register a handler. So whenever there's a new message that comes in, I want to do something. In this case, that something is take the content of the message and then plot it on a, uh, a progress plot, which is a nice thing that you can use to sort of plot real-time data because it can be updated um, as, it's, as it's displayed. And I'm gonna just sort of, you can sit here and just have this loop forever and just listen for messages um, you know, until the heat death of the universe. But in this case, I'm going to just listen a couple of times so you get the idea. So now there we go. So it pulled in a bunch of data that it sort of uh, already had in its um, store. And now it's waiting for more stuff to come in. And um, you know, I've got my, the publisher is only sending data every, every once in a while. And so it takes, um, takes a bit more time for it to, to send messages. It's got a little delay built in. So there we go. We went over a lot of stuff about how to use the, the Edge platform, what capabilities it has. And I wanted now to go back to a slide, uh, which of course has uh, helpfully lost my position. Here we go. Yeah, testbed development roadmap. So what we have today, what I've just shown is uh, we have early preview availability of the, the Edge platform. Now you can log in with federated identity. Uh, it's very easy to manage your sort of allocation and projects, especially if you already have one on Chameleon. We have reconfigurable networking, public IP capability. One thing I did not show is that um, while it's possible to just launch containers on this sort of built-in network that we have just to get started, you can actually create your own isolated network, and then uh, you know that you're sort of the only tenant on that network exchanging traffic at layer three, if that's important to you. We have various different interfaces to the edge testbed. And right now we have a homogenous device pool of Raspberry Pis, uh, but you can reserve those ahead of time for exclusive access. Oh, one thing I did not show, which I forgot to show, is that uh, we also have a way of seeing um, availability of the devices. So uh, when you make a lease, you can actually see all of your leases here. Um, you can see I've got a few different leases active. And, uh, but you can also importantly see a device calendar that sort of shows you, um, you know, like which devices are, are available when. And this also lets you sort of figure out like what the um, availability is. As you can see, there's a lot of uh, opportunity for getting started today. Now, uh, imminently, we're going to be expanding the pool of devices that we have, sort of mentioned Jets and Nanos before. Uh, we expect those to come online like in the next couple of days, sort of ironing out some of the last bits and making sure that those, those GPUs are, are warmed up and able to be utilized for, uh, so you'll be able to actually connect the GPUs to your containers. And uh, at the end of the summer, uh, we're looking to really expand the Edge platform more into a full-fledged Chameleon offering. 
uh, notably uh, starting uh, adding support in our hardware discovery page, which if you haven't used that before, is basically a nice browsable catalog of all the bare metal hardware that Camellia currently has. There's a lot of it, so it takes a lot to load. Um, but you can really filter in and explore the different types of resources that we have. And so the edge resources will eventually make it here in some way to make it easier to, to find. And uh, really the bulk of the interesting work will be in finding and integrating various new types of sensors and peripherals, so not just GPUs, but things like SDRs, cameras, um, other types of sensors that are um, interesting for experimentation. And as Kate said, we're also looking to expand into the bring your own device um, capability, allowing you to either enroll your device into the, the, the edge test bed wholesale, or just uh, have a way to, if you just have a device you want to just connect to an existing chameleon experiment, but not connect it to Chi at Edge entirely. The difference being that you can't use like the container interface to schedule containers. You have to do that yourself, but you can at least connect it to the same network as an, uh, a chameleon experiment. So you lose a bit of like maybe reproducibility. It's, it's harder to share those types of experiments, but um, you know, recognizing that a lot of people just have devices that they just want to connect. Um, we're looking at that as well. And yeah, lastly, as again, as Kate said, we're really interested in particularly feedback from the research community about which of the sort of things that we have are, are cool, which are maybe, oh, we don't really need that so much. And, oh, what do we not have that is really important to have? And so this is what the Google group is for. And again, if you are interested in contributing devices, you can also email um, Kate or myself directly. I think that was everything I wanted to cover. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen if I could find it. And I believe we can maybe do some Q&A. OK. And I see that we've got uh, one question in Q&A from Anirunda. Is it possible to manage a cluster of containers, those two questions actually, by a Docker Swarm or Kubernetes using the GUI or API that was demonstrated? And I, um, Jason, do you want to do that or should I jump in? Um, I, I guess yeah, to, to start, I'll say that this the system that we have is, it's, it's sort of similar to Docker Swarm or Kubernetes, but we don't provide those parallel interfaces. Um, so it's intended to be uh, more for, you know, it, it, it's more of a chameleon flavor of those two, I guess is the, the best way of saying it. Um, but that being said, it, it is something that has a lot of interoperability with the underlying um, mechanisms at play in Docker Swarm and Kubernetes. And so a lot of the, um, a lot of the, the principles apply. And I think Kubernetes in particular is something that we're going to have our eye on because obviously with containers, it's, uh, it's very relevant, but, um, you know, haven't really seen much in the way of uh, su support or integration for this, for the type of things that we want to enable for, for research. Um, yeah. yeah, and maybe Kate, you want to expand on that. Yeah, and to, to just add to what Jason just said, so currently the interfaces that we provide on the back end are implemented using OpenStack Zoom, which, uh, as Jason explained, is similar to, to Kubernetes and Docker Swarm, provides similar types of uh, things. Um, and, and it's an implementation choice, right? If we discover that there are some capabilities that we can't provide in this way, then we'll rethink that implementation and it's you know we're, we're listening if there are things that if if you feel that kubernetes will give you something uh, that that zoom implementation does not give you uh, this is what the summer is for to discover those things and i see that it already wandered to the answered list but there was another question actually there um Secondly, is it possible to use orchestration tools like Ansible, Chef, Pup, Chef Puppet, etc.? And yes, it is possible, right? So uh, Jason demonstrated an example that used Jupyter Notebook for implementing orchestration. But if you are used to orchestrating your deployments with Ansible or Puppet, you can by all means use that as an orchestration tool as well. Um, I would say for now, we did not integrate our implementation with um, heat, which is something that 
we provide as a as an orchestration vehicle in our regular offering in the regular chameleon um, and and again depending on user feedback this is something that we would consider or not consider for now, Jupyter Notebooks seem to be the, the, the most popular tool for structuring complex experiments. Um, Ansible and Puppet and, and other scripting vehicles are, of course, uh, a possible and of interest as well. They probably, you know, they require typically more implementation on your side. And I don't know, Jason, if you want to add something to this. Yeah, um, so I guess, the other thing to mention is that they're, again, because we're built on OpenStack commodity uh, software, I was just checking uh, to see if, like, if you wanted, I'm not sure exactly what you meant about using orchestration tools, like if you meant configuring the containers, like the insides of them, or about maybe using it to, to spawn the containers. Um, it is possible to use Ansible, for example, because it uses OpenStack Zoom as the implementation. And there, I can see that there is uh, support in Ansible for this if you want to, um, you know, manage your experiments uh, that way as well. Okay, and any other questions? Any other questions from anybody? Okay, if there are no questions, then I think uh, we are done with the webinar. Thank you so much for your attention. The recording is going to be available and we will post the link to the mailing list. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye.